Al Parnasel. I'm a professor of public policy here at the Kennedy School, and I'll be introducing our other guests in a, in a moment. But let me at least raise some uh, questions about uh, proliferation and things you might try to keep in mind as we discuss the subject and as you hear from our uh, speakers that I think might be worthwhile. First, what is it? Uh, when you ask people what nuclear proliferation is, you may find that you get rather different answers. Does it mean uh, the acquisition of substantial nuclear weapons arsenals uh, to become a real a nuclear weapon state, so to speak? Or does it mean if you have a few weapons, that's what we mean by uh, uh, proliferation? Or does it mean that you've detonated a nuclear weapon? You've conducted a nuclear weapons test? Is that the special signal that uh, determines that proliferation has taken place? Or is it sufficient simply to have the capability or for people to suspect that you may indeed have a bomb in the basement? At what uh, or all of those uh, merely aspects or various stages of uh, proliferation? The second uh, question may seem more apparent, and that's, so why do we care? There are those who would say, now wait a minute, the United States and the Soviet Union have these large nuclear arsenals, 40 years have gone by, notice they haven't had a war despite their conflicting interests, that's probably largely attributable to nuclear deterrence, wouldn't it be nice if everybody had nuclear weapons and then nobody would have uh, wars uh, anymore? And there are some who may believe that that's true, indeed most of them tend to be people, well maybe if my country got them, that would be good, because that would make war less likely. A third uh, sort of question is, who's got what on the scale of proliferating? Where are we now, and, and what are the prospects? For, and that includes uh, not only nation states, uh, where we have uh, five countries with substantial large nuclear arsenals, the United States, Soviet Union, Britain, France, People's Republic of China. We have three more countries that are sort of in this never netherland of, well, India detonated a device, but are they really a nuclear weapon state? And Israel never detonated a device, but gee, most people seem to think that Israel has a number of nuclear weapons. And South Africa, maybe they detonated one, and maybe they didn't, and people keep arguing about it. What category do they fall in. And what are the other countries that we're worried about? And what about non-state groups, terrorist groups? Next question, to some extent, that people will be talking about is what might be done to inhibit proliferation and indeed to manage a more proliferated world, which very little attention is given to? What are the obstacles to doing those things? Uh, what's being done now? And what should be done? So that's sort of a a framework that I find uh, useful at least to, to think about it. Let me uh, first briefly introduce all of our uh, um, speakers and then uh, we'll turn to each of them for what in principle should be no more than 10 minutes each. So we can then turn to uh, questions and uh, uh, from the audience. I'll introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. First is uh, Dr. George Rathjens. Um, Right over here, George is a professor of political science at uh, MIT, a uh, typical kind of professor of political science whose PhD is in chemistry. Um, has, been, uh, has worked in the White House for the uh, forerunner of the uh, president's, for the president's science advisor, the Defense Department, the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and uh, in the Carter administration was uh, in the State Department working on uh, non-proliferation issues and has written widely on virtually all aspects of uh, nuclear weapons um, issues. Our uh, second speaker will be uh, Tom Graham. Tom is a PhD candidate in the political science department at MIT and a fellow at the Center for Science and International Affairs here at the Kennedy School but spent four years with the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency working on non-proliferation issues and particularly with regard to uh, South Asia. Third speaker is Paul Leventhal. Uh, Paul is the president of the Nuclear Control Institute, which he founded in uh, 1981 in Washington. Uh, 
spent a number of years on the staff in the U.S. Senate, the Government Operations Committee and the Nuclear Regulatory Subcommittee, and was one of the principal architects of some of the important uh, nonproliferation legislation, including the Energy Reorganization Act and the Nonproliferation Act of 1978. Fourth speaker is Roger Melander. Uh, Roger is president of the Roosevelt Center for American Policy Studies in Washington. He formerly was the executive director of uh, the group called Ground Zero. Um, and uh, before that was on the National Security Council staff in the White House through, I guess, uh, four presidents. Uh, Nixon, no, not Nixon, Nixon, Ford, Carter, 30 minutes of Nixon, right, because we knew it was 74. <laughs> and uh, President Reagan very briefly in, uh, in uh, 1981. And uh, before that was in the Department of Defense and the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Roger is well known for having, uh, while he was at Ground Zero, being an author of uh, a number of uh, books intended for the general public on uh, these issues. Uh, my favorite being, uh, what was it, Nuclear War, What's in it for You? Um, and the uh, final uh, speaker is uh, Lewis Dunn. Lewis is uh, Assistant Director for Nuclear and Weapons Control at the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. He uh, spent a number of years at the Hudson Institute and uh, wrote uh, one of the finest books in this field of nuclear proliferation called uh, uh, controlling the bomb, nuclear proliferation in the 1980s. So that's, uh, we have Lewis here who's both been a scholar in this field and is now in the administration working on this uh, subject. So let us uh, turn to this uh, distinguished group uh, right away and we start with uh, George Ratchet. Thank you, Al. I think what I will do is uh, give a little bit of background, though I don't, I don't want to argue and I hope we don't get into too much argument here about what past administrations did or did not do. Uh, rather, we should be focusing on where we are now, but I think a little background is, is, is relevant and probably important. If I go back a dozen years, you'll all recollect, but maybe many of you in this room won't, but those at the table will, uh, the oil shock that hit, this, uh, that hit the world. And um, uh, with that, uh, the prospects for nuclear power uh, seemed to be uh, very promising. And uh, as a result of that, and uh, with the uh, Indians conducting a nuclear test, test of a nuclear device in 1974, uh, uh, there arose uh, in the United States, in the Congress, and uh, in the executive branch as well, a great concern about the uh, spread of nuclear weapons. It had been there before, but this was an accentuated concern. And in both Ford and then the Carter administrations, but particularly the latter, uh, the issue of nonproliferation became a very important policy matter. And in particular, in the Carter administration, uh, with the prospect of nuclear power growing, uh, the emphasis, uh, a major point of emphasis, not the exclusive emphasis, but a major point of emphasis uh, all through the administration was trying to prevent this spread of, uh, of, of nuclear weapons through, in one way or another, uh, constraining what might be done in the nuclear power field. Uh, people were particularly concerned about uh, the development of what, in the jargon of the trade, was referred to as a plutonium economy a situation in the world where plutonium would be used, uh, extracted from reactors, uh, uh, from the fuel from reactors, and then used again to fuel those reactors of the kinds we now have operating, so-called light water reactors and others, uh, but also to use in breeder reactors. And the concern was that uh, if that were allowed to happen, uh, the plutonium would become so accessible uh, to so many people, uh, other countries, countries that don't have weapons, conceivably even terrorists, that uh, something should be done about it. Uh, that was uh, a major thrust of the Carter administration. Um, and uh, uh, it had in more or less had some successes, some failures. Uh, we'll probably talk about some of those things uh, tonight. But let me now jump, uh, jump ahead to where we are now and how things have changed uh, since the Carter days. Uh, a lot has happened. Uh, for one thing, uh, the, nuclear, the projections for the growth of nuclear power have uh, been dratic, uh, drastically uh, uh, reduced. Nuclear power is dead in this country. It's uh, almost as dead in, in many others, going nowhere. No new orders for nuclear reactors in many years, many cancellations. And with that, uh, the impetus to get into the nuclear uh, business, and particularly into a plutonium economy, has in many countries been greatly reduced. Uh, 
Uh, uranium is a drug on the market. Uh, at one time, it was felt that there would be a, be a shortage, and that was one of the reasons for going ahead with uh, getting into the plutonium business. So uh, that's all changed. Um, and we face a new environment. Uh, we're in a, a situation where uh, uh, the position of the United States uh, in, in particular is a, is a very different one than it was, say, at the time of the Ford administration. It changed drastically during the Carter years. What I think I'll do uh, in the very few minutes, and I don't want to take more than about five more, is to try to summarize what I think are the good things and the bad things about where we are now. What's, what's, what is the good news? What is, what, what's the bad news? What are the prospects? Um, well, the good news, if you look at this from a long perspective, is that the rate of spread of nuclear weapons to additional countries has been very, very much less than people had anticipated decades ago. Uh, at the time of the Kennedy administration, uh, people were projecting a growth in the number of countries possessing nuclear weapons uh, to 10 or 20 or something like that. Um, and in fact, uh, it's been pretty stable. We have not had a new entry into the field uh, since 1974 when the Indians tested a nuclear device. If your measure of entry is the actual explosion of a device. Um, and that's the longest period uh, of, of quiescence in this sense. So the spread of nuclear weapons has been slow. That certainly has to be regarded as good news by, by those who think that the spread is, uh, is, is undesirable. I think probably everybody at this table does think it's undesirable. I happen to think uh, in general that it, that it is. Uh, <clears throat> many would argue that the change in the energy business is a desirable factor. Uh, this uh, uh, diminution in the demand for uh, electricity and the uh, general, uh, generally rough time that nuclear power has had obviously means that fewer nations are going to be building nuclear reactors for power generation purposes. Uh, less people are going to school and learning the technology. Uh, the price of uranium, as I remarked, is low enough so that there's less impetus to extract the plutonium to use it. Um, and uh, all of that, I suppose, is good if you, if you are opposed to proliferation. One has to say, though, that with the demise in the, of the industry, the, the people who are involved in making reactors are, as they have been for some time, desperate to sell them. And uh, so that uh, there is a pressure there from the vendors to try to uh, sell the technology on terms, on almost any terms that they can get away with, uh, because they have this great overcapacity. Um, there are other, uh, uh, some other promising things that I would say in our present situation. Some of the countries about which we have uh, been worried uh, really don't have the capability and don't appear to be get, uh, uh, getting anywhere with the technology. Uh, people worried about Iraq, uh, particularly before the uh, Israelis attacked that reactor. Uh, and there's no evidence that Iraq is really moving along toward acquiring nuclear weapons. None of the states in the Middle East uh, really have the capacity to do much on their own, and that's probably the most unstable part of the world. They're going to have to get help from outside if they want to get into the nuclear power or the nuclear weapons business, either one, on a significant scale. And uh, so far, there's very little evidence that anybody is willing to provide that, uh, that help to them. So all of that is, uh, is good news. On the bad news side, and I think the bad news, uh, I regret to say, I think has to outweigh the good. Uh, there is bad news. Um, we have a new entrant uh, into the uh, uh, business of supplying technology uh, and helping people uh, get into the business, and that's China. Uh, China has been uh, 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 more disposed uh, to offer assistance without restraint uh, in this area than uh, any of the other nations, and, and particularly this is a problem with Pakistan. We have had a couple of surprises uh, in the case of Argentina. Uh, uh, the announcement uh, some time ago that uh, they had uh, developed uh, clandestinely a, a plant for enriching uranium, one of the, uh, one of the paths that can be used to make weapons. Uh, people had begin to, begun to write off the possibility of Argentina's getting into the business. Pakistan is probably the most uh, serious uh, threat in the near term. Uh, Tom Graham will be talking about that, so I won't say much, but let me just say that as far as I know, uh, Pakistan continues to move right along with a program to get into the weapons business, notwithstanding some efforts to try to restrain it. On a larger scale, when one looks at the problem as a whole, um, it does seem to me the prospects are not, are not all that great. It has become clear, I think, uh, 
based on the uh, actions of the United States uh, and of the other major powers, that uh, none of them take nuclear, the nuclear proliferation problem as the highest priority item on their agenda. Whenever there is a question of a trade-off of, uh, of uh, uh, a, tra a trade-off kind of a problem uh, relating to the nuclear proliferation question, generally uh, it loses out. Uh, that is illustrated in the Pakistan case where we, uh, where as soon as the Soviet Union uh, moved into Afghanistan, uh, the United States felt that it was uh, uh, the better part of wisdom uh, to ease off on trying to uh, restrain the Pakistanis from getting into the weapons business in order to build them up as a buttress to uh, uh, the Soviet Union's efforts to move into South Asia. And that ha that's happened time and again. So that uh, with the nuclear proliferation problem clearly being a relatively low priority, I think, on every nation's uh, agenda, uh, compared to other concerns, uh, it does not bode well uh, for the future. Uh, in the case of the United States, uh, we have lost most of the leverage that we had during the Ford years uh, to exert pressure on other countries. Uh, if one goes back to the Ford years and the beginning of the Carter administration, the United States had a lot of leverage. We were a principal supplier of technology and we provided the enrichment service uh, on which most of the free world's uh, reactors uh, operated. Uh, uh, things have changed. Uh, with the demise of the industry in this country, we no longer are the leaders in the technology we were, and there are other sources of enrichment service and other sources of uranium. So if we want to exert any leverage on anybody else now, it cannot be based on a special position in the nuclear industry, uh, a situation that has changed. Um, uh, the knowledge, of course, in this area uh, will continually spread, uh, and uh, there's no way of no way of reversing that. Uh, we're going to have more people learning the relevant uh, uh, relevant uh, information uh, that's required to to make weapons. The training of engineers here and there and scientists is just make just makes that inevitable. Um, there is, um, in, my, in my view, uh, an almost inevitable erosion of confidence in the United States as a guarantor of other nations' security. And that comes about because of the changing balance between the United States and the Soviet Union in the, weapon, in the, in the larger field of military affairs, and because nations just trust us less and less, uh, I think. I might say here, I think that, the, uh, that we even run into this problem in Europe, and we're running into it now with these uh, things like the uh, Strategic uh, Defense Initiative causing great divisiveness with our allies. And uh, if these kinds of policies uh, continue to obtain, it would seem to me uh, quite plausible that the uh, Europeans and uh, others who have depended on us will in time begin to think they've got to watch out for their own interests. Ultimately, the best, guarantee, the best solution, to, and the only long-term solution, to dealing with the proliferation problem has to be to relieve nations of their security concerns and you do that by either offering them security guarantees or by resolving disputes that they have with their neighbors that might motivate them to get uh, weapons. Uh, in this connection, I might just say I think the greatest success we've had in many years was the Camp David initiative where, where we did, to some degree, reduce that tension between Israel and Egypt. Uh, I don't see that happening in the present administration, and I don't see us doing, taking other actions that can convince other nations that we're going to that they can trust us. If they can't, I'm afraid sooner or later uh, other nations are going to uh, get into the business. So I cannot, from a longer-term perspective, uh, be very optimistic about, uh, about where we're, we're going. In the very short term, we probably can continue with the collaboration of the other principal suppliers to limit the likelihood that some nations will get into this business who might want to. A country like Libya, for example, probably still wants to get into the weapons business, but it can't do it on its own, and it can be restrained by policies of denial on the part of the major powers for some time. And in the short term, I think that will continue to obtain. And with the exception of the Chinese, I don't think we have to worry very much about the other nuclear powers providing the technology. In the long term, I think the only hope uh, can be in reducing motivations. Thank you, George. I was just passing you a note. I know that. Time. I saw it coming. <laughs> <laughs> Our next uh, speaker, Tom Graham. I'd like to make three basic points. 
looking at the subject from the perspective of two countries that have been worried that the, e that the other country would develop nuclear weapons at some point in time, and that's India and Pakistan. And my comments are really looking back not just at this administration or this administration and the previous Carter administration, but looking back 30 years, because it usually takes almost that long for a country to make the decision it wants to invest in a nuclear power facility, nuclear research facilities, somewhere along that decision to try to uh, get the option to make a bomb. So it's not something that happens overnight. Three propositions are, first one, that there's a phrase now people are using which is managing proliferation. And my sense of that is that managing means it makes sure that countries don't use nuclear weapons, make sure that they don't test them, make sure they don't transfer them, but it spends a little bit, it takes a little bit more realistic perspective on can we actually stop the spread. And sort of drawing on what George said, I would agree that we can't stop the spread. But my argument would be that managing is going to be ten times more difficult than what we've really tried to do up till now, which is slowing or stopping. Second proposition, that there's unfortunately been a fairly wide gap between rhetoric that American government officials have used and what we've actually done. And that that gap has reduced our credibility, not in general, but in a very specific area, which is if we need credibility in a crisis to keep countries from either producing nuclear weapons or hopefully this will never happen or of using them, that I'm afraid that that pattern of 30 years of hypocrisy, if you will, may come back to haunt us. Third point is that the absence of looking more than just beyond the next crisis, which has been true of all administrations in this area, means that once a country seems to get a weapon or have one in the basement, that even though people don't admit it in the U.S., they tend to sort of say, well, there isn't much we can do, and sort of forget about it. And what that means is that slowly but surely um, countries, once they develop some capability, will be building more and more, and it, after five weapons it becomes 50 and 500, and that if we're looking in the long run, um, we may be looking at a world that's very different than the one we think about today. So how do these three propositions play out in South Asia? Managing. Um, up until now, from the point of view of the U.S., what we've had to figure out is, are India and Pakistan making the bomb? Are they making components for it? How are they getting it? And sort of how far along are they? But our track record on some of the more subtle points hasn't been very good. In 1965, there was a major, totally open debate in the Indian political parties. Should they make nuclear weapons? And that whole debate was virtually lost on the U.S. government. Really, there's virtually no record of it, and it didn't seem an important event. Um, same thing happened in Pakistan in 1971 where the Bhutto decided that he actually was going to seriously put together a nuclear weapons design team. And uh, that was also an instance where the U.S. really didn't learn about it for several years afterwards. So with that track record, how are we going to be able to learn what we need to learn in real time, not after a year's delay or two years delay, but in real time is something that is not just going to be more difficult, but by a quantum step more difficult. Second one is management. At a day-to-day -day level, one of the problems in the U.S. government is that there are experts all over Washington, but very few of them spend a full day working on one country so they know it backwards and forwards and in and out. So that there isn't one person that, you, that the president could go to and say, I want the definitive answer to this question and I want it in two minutes. And it's a very difficult problem because to become an expert in this field, you have to learn a little bit of the technology and the foreign policy. And you have to have it integrated in one person's brain so that you can get a quick response. And unfortunately, um, no administrations have made much luck at rationalizing our policies in that sense. In the case of South Asia, India and Pakistan have fought three wars. And during those wars, both countries have made decisions, a whole series of them, which had actually restrained the level of conflict. Would this happen if they both had nuclear weapons? Um, would the U.S. know about it? 
Would the U.S. know about it in real time and know about what to do so that we don't make the problem worse rather than better, which is easily a possibility. So I think that on that level, I tend to get more pessimistic on management than George is about the spread. But the main concern with South Asia now is the policy that has been taken with regard to Pakistan and that the current administration has made a decision based on what the Carter administration was doing that we need to strengthen Pakistan's security in order to reduce its desire to produce nuclear weapons and its need. The problem with that isn't of the strategy, it's a fundamentally logical strategy, but it's in the process of carrying it out just by the way you tend to do it, you tend to reinforce the idea that the U.S. doesn't care about this subject. I don't think that's true. I don't think the Reagan administration has given up on proliferation to South Asia. But by selling them military hardware, by maybe playing a much more sophisticated game in saying go up to a particular level but don't go over that, that the messages that we send to the Indians and to the Soviets and to our allies particularly when you're always going to have instances where you can't control everything. So it, on the one hand, we're helping Pakistan, but on the other, um, they're buying nuclear weapons parts in the U.S. It doesn't look very good. And the main reason why it doesn't look very good is it tells India, well, America's given up. So um, I think that's a very unstable position, and it's one that's endemic to making a serious effort at this. And it's the type of conflict and the hard trade-off that people will have all the time. Last one is looking at towards the future with alternatives, and that because the U.S. government over many administrations has made decisions, for example, not to sign a comprehensive test ban treaty, that that isn't an instrument that we can now go to the Indians and the Pakistanis and say, well, maybe in order to convince the other side that they're not making weapons or they couldn't build a lot of nuclear weapons that they would have confidence in, maybe if both you countries signed such an agreement with other countries of the world, that starts to begin a process where you could see that you could give confidence to the country on the other side of the border that they didn't have to live on a hair trigger. Because no administration in the U.S. has paid that cost, we don't have that option now. It's not under serious negotiations and it won't be a near-term option for the future. Um, the same thing has happened in that continually administrations would be pushed from one goal and proliferation to another, first trying to get Pakistan to safeguard all of its reactors, and then failing that, trying to get them to stop work on their enrichment facility, and then failing that, um, trying to get them not to violate safeguards, and then possibly with the success there, saying, well, don't, it, don't produce the kind of uranium that could very quickly be used in a bomb, paints a picture of acquiescing, which unfortunately is quite consistent. And if I were an Indian on the other side of the border, or if I were a Pakistani and had seen that after India tested in 1974, the U.S. continued to supply nuclear equipment, even though it may have been a very rational short-term decision, wouldn't have given me confidence and so it's on that question of what the U.S. can do, not to stop or to slow proliferation, but to give countries in the region confidence that there is some fire break between some capability that could be converted into a weapon to make sure that we don't, in a crisis, have a situation where the president wakes up, and unlike the image of the Soviet Union where we spend billions upon billions of dollars worrying about the possibility of a bolt out of the blue or a shot somewhere, that we literally don't have the capability to know, and at even close to the magnitude that we need, whether one of these weapons might go off. And that it's at that level where I think the, the whole question of resources is a major one and is one that's open for public pressure because the amount of money that's spent on balance, I tried to do a rough calculation this afternoon, we spend the equivalent of about three jet fighter planes per year on our nonproliferation budget, and that's everything. Salaries, staff, overhead, everything. If, in fact, we really care about this subject, it seems like quite a small price to pay.
Paul? I just said to Lou Dunn, who will speak tonight in defense of the administration's policy, that he's worth at least one B-1 bomber. I've been asked to talk a little bit about the threat of nuclear terrorism, which is a sort of a mind-boggling subject, one that many feel is best not discussed at all, because simply to discuss it might invite the very ultimate terror that you're trying to prevent. But I think it's worth discussing. And the organization that I represent is undertaking a project this year to first hold a conference, which we did this past June, on the subject in Washington, a cross-disciplinary look at the problem, to look at terrorism on the one hand, to look at nuclear development, nuclear weapons on the other, and see if there is, in fact, some ultimate interplay which could cause great grief and destruction to the world. And we are now in the process of forming an international task force to build upon the uh, work of the conference to develop a set of findings and recommendations, and that work will hope, hopefully be complete by next June. The possibilities of nuclear terrorism are being talked about more and more because of the changing character of terrorism. Uh, terrorists today seem to be bolder, more fanatic, more violent, more terrifying than in recent memory based on the uh, uh, events that we've witnessed in the Middle East and in Ireland and, of course, elsewhere in the world. But there's also another aspect, and that is the availability of high technology, the availability of substantial resources, particularly in the form of state support of terrorist activities, and probably the most compelling causative factor is the phenomenon now of uh, support by uh, Libya and Iran in particular for international terrorist activities. So we would argue that it's worth looking at the question of terrorism through the nuclear lens and what do you find? Uh, you find a lot of vulnerabilities and some of them are relatively fixable. Uh, for example, uh, the status of our weapons in NATO installations in Europe. Uh, Presumably, uh, resources can be applied there, uh, assuming we have the cooperation of our NATO partners to, uh, to harden those facilities against possible terrorist attack. Uh, weapons can be better protected against theft uh, by means of self-protecting devices, and uh, steps are being taken in this direction. <clears throat> There's also the uh, problem of the vulnerability of nuclear facilities to sabotage both the insider threat and the external threat. That's a more difficult problem particularly outside of the military sphere, because in the civilian sector, uh, you're in the realm of private enterprise, and there are limits to what a company is willing to spend, whether it be a nuclear utility or uh, even a uh, conventional industry, to protect against the possible threat of nuclear terrorism, if, in fact, they would be compelled to put up uh, very big bucks for what would be deemed a, uh, a very uh, remote risk. But the conference did bring together uh, specialists in industrial security and specialists in nuclear technology and terrorism, and uh, there was a useful dialogue on that point. But I would submit that the greatest long-term threat is one that probably most of you in the audience are not aware of. Uh, I would call it the orphan issue within the nonproliferation issue, which in turn is an orphan issue in the uh, realm of uh, foreign policy and national security area. Uh, and that's the issue of plutonium in particular. I would generalize it more to the use of uh, explosive nuclear materials in civilian programs. The quantities that are beginning to come into existence, and they are brought into existence, they don't occur naturally, they're manufactured by man uh, for use uh, either in nuclear power plants, and that's plutonium, separated from the spent fuel of nuclear power plants, and highly enriched uranium, which is just a super enriched form of uranium that is the preferred fuel uh, for research reactors. Now, there's some progress being made uh, <clears throat> in developing a consensus among uh, research reactor operators uh, to steer away from the use of highly enriched uranium to a lower enriched form that uh, uh, is not explosive. And, in fact, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is about to uh, issue a rule 
uh, requiring this uh, among university test reactors and, and uh, some of the private industrial reactors in this country. And the United States has had a, uh, an effort underway for about 10 years now to persuade foreign operators to do the same. And since we're the supplier of uh, almost all of the highly enriched uranium used in research reactors throughout the world, we have some influence to bring to bear there. And uh, there seems to be movement, however slow. I would add, and perhaps Lou Dunn would later comment on this, that this administration has not been as forceful in pressing this particular uh, aspect uh, and, in fact, testified before the NRC that, that the rule itself would have only a marginal effect on, uh, on efforts to uh, persuade foreign operators. Yet uh, there have been annual meetings of foreign operators who made, have made it quite clear that they're not prepared to make the first move, that the U.S. should make the first move, and then they'll be prepared to follow. The greater immediate problem, not necessarily the one for the longest term, but the greatest immediate problem is the problem of plutonium. Uh, nuclear power plants produce prodigious amounts of plutonium in their spent fuel, uh, something like the rate of 50 tons a year throughout the world. Uh, compare this with the fact that about 15 pounds or less is needed for one atomic bomb. The projected inventory of plutonium produced and spent fuel by the year 2000 uh, will be uh, uh, some 1,400 tons, of which by that time, according to present industrial planning, that is reprocessing plants that are now built and operating and are in the process of being built or planned to be built shortly, there will be some 400 tons separated. Compare that number with the 200 tons of plutonium that the U.S. and the USSR between them have in their nuclear weapons. In other words, there'll be twice as much plutonium in the civilian sector by the year 2000 than there is now in the weapons sector, and the total inventory by that time will be 1,400 tons. So the average citizen presumably would think, by golly, we've got a problem here, and uh, uh, can this stuff be managed? Uh, can it be effectively safeguarded against sneak diversions uh, by nations into, uh, into clandestine weapons making? Can it be protected? Uh, against theft by terrorists. And here, I would submit, is the greatest problem, and I would also submit it's a problem gaining the least attention, because in political terms, it's the most difficult to deal with. The reason for that is that our closest allies and trading partners in Europe and Japan uh, are determined to proceed with plutonium as a long-term energy option uh, for the purpose of energy security. Uh, many of them, like uh, Germany and Japan in particular are not nations rich in, in domestic energy resources, and they justify their program on that basis. They're insensitive, in my view, to the example this sets, particularly for the third world. It truly whets appetites. It gains, it develops a sense of uh, uh, legitimacy and status uh, if, in fact, the advanced industrial countries proceed along this line. Uh, how are we ultimately to prevent the third world countries from doing the same? And then what do we have uh, in the way of the future? I believe the present policy, one that basically came directly from the previous administration's policy, is, uh, is one that is biased uh, in favor of um, uh, highly focused efforts to prevent uh, immediate transfers of sensitive materials and technology to the third world. And I would argue that that's a laudable uh, objective. Uh, but part of that strategy is to win the cooperation of our uh, uh, allies and trading partners uh, in this uh, effort by deciding not to antagonize them, by pressing uh, them uh, not to proceed with the reprocessing of fuel that originated in the United States, fuel that was enriched in the United States, exported to those countries. In many cases, not all cases, but in many cases they require our consent to do that. The Carter administration attempted, following on a policy actually established by the Ford administration, to withhold that consent, cause great uh, grief diplomatically, and the decision was made, as, as Dr. Rathjens pointed out, that since we didn't have the leverage, we, uh, we had no choice but ultimately to acquiesce. I would argue that we have plenty of leverage if we're prepared to uh, extend uh, the um, exercising of our influence beyond the narrow sphere of nuclear commerce. Uh, if we're prepared to uh, make it a subject upon which uh, many of our, many aspects of our bilateral uh, relationships with these countries uh, would come into play, I think we 
the United States uh, would have uh, substantial leverage. My time is just about up. It's hard to cover uh, the subject in 10 minutes. I've tried to uh, give you a, uh, a basic introduction, so to speak, into the underlying problem, as I would characterize it, the so-called nuclear fuel cycle. It's the most neglected. It's clearly the most difficult to deal with politically. I would submit it is the most urgent and deserving fi far <clears throat> higher priority than is now the case. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Roger Molander. <clears throat> this will be nuclear proliferation. What's in it for you? Um, first of all, you've got to understand, uh, I come to this subject uh, from a different order in the nuclear priesthood. That time I spent on the NSC staff was spent you know, with the Franciscans that were working strategic weapons and strategic nuclear arms control. And I didn't spend much time down the hall with the people that were working the proliferation issue. And that gives me a bias of sorts. Uh, I come from a particular point on the compass, especially, I would say, with respect to the limited agenda that a president has in terms of time and ability to build expertise, and also the extreme difficulty of two nations settling up uh, as the U.S. and the Soviet Union have sort of struggled to do, and I would say sort of when they're led by male chiefs and advised by male advisors, and that is a, obviously another lecture. Um, when I first read into this issue about a year and a half ago, um, I got to tell you, as someone who, like Al Carnesel, was a nuclear engineer at one time, I came away appalled at how far the spread of the technology had gone and what the prospects, in fact, were for, as we have been hearing today, stopping the spread of the ability to build nuclear weapons, which I think is far and away more than the issue of whether somebody's tested a nuclear weapon or whether someone has a bomb program, the issue that should be foremost in our minds as we take a long view, and only by taking a long view can you get any optimism about this subject at all, that when you take a long view about what to do about it. Um, and in that sense, one has to start thinking about just what is the objective we are trying to seek? Can one adhere to or s sustain a policy that in fact has an objective of stopping the spread of nuclear weapons, where by that you mean stopping bomb programs, not stopping testing because we are clearly in a realm in which testing is really not a criterion. It's an issue of bomb programs. With that kind of long-term perspective, as I look at what if you will, current policy is with the administration and the Congress, uh, you can really immediately see that this is not an issue of the Reagan administration and how it has behaved itself, but it's really a much larger question, as you have heard here tonight, is it's sort of Paul Simon slip sliding away. Are we sliding down a slippery slope towards an inevitable situation where slowly over time, where time is generations, more and more nations get the bomb? That means, I think, fundamental changes in the policy that exists today. And by that, not so much uh, changes in existing policy where you have set policy sales for some landfall that you're aiming at, but mostly in terms of adding things to the agenda, things we should be working on that we're not working on right now. If one takes that kind of long view, Roughly, I'd argue, you can break down the policy that we should be thinking about, including those things that we are, into five basic areas, and I'm going to try and crash through that here in about 10 minutes. The first of them is obvious. It's nuclear club, nuclear arms control, if you want to call it that. Them that's got weapons and arsenals and what they do about it. There isn't a chance in the world of stopping the spread of bomb programs, if you will, if the U.S. and the Soviet Union don't get their nuclear arms competition settled, gutted, rendered boring, which is what I thought my job was working on assault negotiations, get it off the table. It so preoccupies both the President of the United States and his upper echelons that there's hardly room for, if you will, the urgent uh, hot spots of the world like the Middle East, much less for moving an issue with this kind of long-term importance onto the front burner. And that concept that, you know, a president's got no more room but for two or three issues on his, her front burner on national security sort of matters 
has to be kept in mind when you think about what this country in its clear leadership position is going to have to do on this issue. But right behind getting the U.S.-Soviet competition gutted is the issue of French, British, and Chinese involvement in this. What is the responsibility of them that have nuclear weapons? I'd say again, unless China, British are easy, unless China and France joins the human race in trying to work this problem, there again, and you've got a question about U.S. leverage, I don't know how you're going to solve the problem as long as they go their own way and do not become engaged in the issue of what are some norms of behavior, what are some rules of the nuclear road. Right behind that, of course, is the other nations that have been mentioned here that have bomb programs. I mean, I don't know what the biggest illusion people have is this idea of a nuclear club where the criterion is testing. The issue is who's got bomb programs, and I think even more important, who has had bomb programs, to which you have to add countries like South Korea and Taiwan, where we stepped on them you know, 10, 12 years ago to stop those programs, for which their programs bore vivid testimony, as the programs of you know, France and Israel have as well, that the big umbrella and the protecting arms of the United States government and its 25,000 nuclear weapons aren't good enough for countries that feel insecure. The next realm is this whole question of nuclear exports or some code of nuclear behavior in terms of exports or helping countries with bombs or even having bomb programs. There is a fairly well-developed set of policies on that, Symington Amendment, Glenn Amendment, things that you can hear people that are in this business throw around. But the issue really is one of adhering to that set of policies without exceptions. What we have now is a set of policies where if you look closely at it, you can say, well, there's exceptions, and Pakistan is certainly the principal example recently, of, well, yeah, we've got this policy, but when we get mad or when certain friends want things, well, then we make exceptions. That is a norm where you are really trying to posture yourself, as I think somebody said, as a leader in this business, which is absolutely unacceptable. <coughs> if there's one major policy change or s strategy change, if you will, it's that we must find a policy for which there are no exceptions. Because only then can you go to other nations and say, here's a kind of norm of behavior that we all ought to be able to subscribe to because we all really care about this stuff. Can that be done? Clearly, in a situation where each administration makes independent judgments about how to make those things, handles each country on a case-by-case -case basis, it's just not good enough. The idea of coming together on a coherent policy that we are going to sustain between administrations is a challenge that I would say is probably going to have to be worked with the American electorate, or the electorate is going to have to demand that kind of consistency, because you're certainly not getting it from a succession of, of administrations. But right behind that kind of thing is, as I think George said, just the inexorable spread of this technology, the ability to build nuclear weapons. And you can argue about you know, how fast that's going to take place. And people cite CIA says by the year 2000, 50 countries of the 170 will have the capability of the to bomb or not to bomb, making up their own mind about it. You, know, you don't need to have too much sort of too many mathematics courses to extrapolate that to say that within a generation or two, basically, you know, you pick a number, 70, 100, it's all over. Countries are going to have that choice. Will they make it? They'll make it if they're insecure. I mean, that's the fundamental lesson. They will develop bomb programs if they're insecure, whether they'll bring them to the testing stage or not. That doesn't matter so much because the issue is, is it going to be there? Is it going to be either in the basement or on some missiles or some bombers or if you will, you whistle down the hall to the physics lab and say, hey, get me one of those. And they say, hey, man, it's going to take six weeks. And they say, okay, that's fine. I'll wait six weeks. Or whether you do like the Swedes did and you can argue about how many steps down the path to knowing you can get the bomb, you know, countries will make. The Swedes clearly have taken some steps. And, you know, somewhere in Stockholm there's a piece of paper that says reindeer aurora on it. And it says, hey, the material is here and it takes six weeks or maybe it's six days or something like that. But countries are going to do that. There's a succession of steps, and they're all going to go some path, some distance down that path, and you're going to see a spectrum of situations where people are anywhere from, I got a bunch of them, to I can get them in a few weeks. If one recognizes that, I think as George said, the issue 
that one must deal with is this issue of nation state security and stop kidding ourselves that we continue, can continue to have a world in which there is this ebb and flow of how people feel and how secure they feel about their nation state. Am I going to have to give ground, whether it's you know, the, whatever the current and future versions of the Alsace-Lorraine are or the fighting over Kashmir and the borders there? Clearly, we have to make that extraordinary transition to the point where, hey, everybody's feeling real good about their security. And you don't have that, well, okay, we let countries like Iran and Iraq fight it out from time to time, or the British and the, you know, the Argentinians go through that. Focusing on that reality, the fact that we're going to have to move into a world like that, I think raises fundamental questions about whether we're prepared or preparing for that kind of world. In some sense, we used to prepare ourselves for the, issue, for the world of guaranteeing our own security and that of others by thinking in terms of war. And if you look at the history books, it's not hard to see how we think in those terms. As opposed to preparing ourselves for a world in which peaceful conflict resolution, to use these kinds of buzzwords, but basically finding some way for countries to make peace, is really the, the premium skill that is prevails or that we seek to have within our national security or even within our, just basically within our country. And that's a, I think, a kind of question which uh, not so much any administration, but the country as a whole has got to start thinking about in terms of who's going to do that. Because whereas it, you know, crudely put, it may have been obviously right that the boys were the best people to go and fight the wars ever since it was the tribe over the hill that, you know, worshipped tree stumps and had three heads. It may not at all be that in terms of how we train human beings, which human beings, which sexes, we want to prepare for that kind of whole sort of challenge of, hey, we cannot let countries use force to resolve differences because nuclear weapons are always going to be too close at hand. If you move beyond that kind of question, you've got to eventually, however, get to the point where you know, you've got to say, well, what about two, three generations hence, where some relatively small number of human beings, possibly totally independent of any nation state, are going to be able to produce one or a few of these things. And that's, that's the right numbers to think about. Not does somebody have a big program so they've got a few hundred or, sort of, or a few dozen of these things, but it's the use of a one or a few of these things that I think is the problem that we all are really sort of worrying about as we worry about nuclear proliferation. We figure if somebody uses a lot, we'll be able to tell who it is, deterrence will work, and all of that kind of thing. But it's the question about how do you ensure security in a world where, say, you know, if there are 20 or 30 potential suspects, as in 20 or 30 bomb programs, and 2.30 one morning or something like that, you know, Washington, D.C. is blown away, and no one claims responsibility. Basically, the world in which you are living under the threat of sort of the anonymous use of nuclear weapons. Whether that is coming from, you know, as I, I like to say, what happens if Washington blow, gets blown away? You'll have a headless state with 25,000 nuclear weapons sort of reeling in anger and, you know, 20 countries in the world who are known to have bomb programs trying to get hold of it and say we didn't do it. That reality tra translated to a whole other bunch of countries whether it's the Soviet Union or France or Israel or India. I had a discussion with, a, uh, with an Indian recently who was saying, well, I don't really think we really have to worry about it. And I said, well, what about if you lose Delhi in another 40 years and you can suspect the Iranians, the Iraqis, the Pakistanians, maybe Sri Lanka, et cetera? It's this kind of threat, I think, the use of a few nuclear weapons and what that might actually do in terms of what crisis you would find yourself in and whether you can really sort of pull in the harness and keep a couple of angry nations from in a situation like that going to war. The idea that it, for a world like that you have to start thinking about taboos is something that's very hard for old nuclear engineers to come up and say to you. But that kind of concept, that we really have to move beyond a world in which these things are around and available, it's, it's just, I'd like to say, it's not too early to think about that and you hope it's not too late. Was done. Thanks. I guess the virtue of, of, of speaking last is that it allows me to 
move my way through a whole series of, of preceding remarks, and I will try to do that uh, expeditiously by speaking as twice as fast as I normally would speak. <laughs> I think the key question is, is what are we trying to do to begin with? And here I would argue that both we as an administration, but we also as people who have been concerned about the spread of nuclear weapons for quite a number of years are trying to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. And we're not trying to manage the problem for reasons I will come back to quickly. In terms of preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, I think we're talking about preventing the acquisition of nuclear weapons, either the covert acquisition, this is the famous uh, somebody who's the screwdriver away from a nuclear weapon, or the overt acquisition and deployment of nuclear weapons in the, along the lines of the United States, the Soviet Union, or the other existing nuclear weapon states. I think in some sense Roger is correct that we are also trying to prevent bomb programs, but here I would like to say dedicated bomb programs. I think there's no way to prevent the fact that, for all I know, there's some professor sitting here uh, in Harvard University who's going to sit down some night and say to himself, gee, if I wanted to make nuclear weapons, what would I do? I don't think you can prevent that, but you can surely try to prevent the situation where there's a dedicated bomb program where some country has a line item in its budget which says uh, two alloys or something like that, such as the United States once called the Manhattan Project to keep the British from ever finding the document when they looked for it later. Why are we trying to prevent the acquisition of nuclear weapons? I think we're trying to prevent the acquisition because as hard it is, as it is to prevent, I think it'll be much harder to manage a world of many nuclear weapon states. Uh, there is a kind of rule of thumb that you could use for Roger's last example, that Washington goes up in smoke in a world of 35 nuclear weapon states, and what do you do? The rule is that the first one is free, and so the first nuclear weapon that gets used, nobody does anything. But it's not a nice rule, and it'll be a very bad world, and so that's why I think a lot of effort is spent on preventing it. If you're going to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons, I think you're trying basically to put together what I've called elsewhere a defense in depth, pieces of it having been touched on tonight, a defense in depth first in the sense of you're trying to make it harder for a country that seeks nuclear weapons to achieve that objective. Here the basic problem we have, which has been, you know, mentioned by several of us already, is this is an old technology. I mean, this technology is, is, is older than, than television. It is from us back to the Manhattan Project. Is, is 40 years. This is very old, and everyone in this room knows the most important thing about nuclear weapons, the most important technical secret about nuclear weapons, which is that they work, which is something that a lot of people did not know until they actually tested one in July of 1945. I think we can go too far, though, if we argue this about the capability spreading all over the world. There's a difference, it seems to me, between a capability to acquire nuclear weapons in theory and a lot of nations at some point in time are going to have that capability if they decide they're going to spend the money and do a lot of other things, if they're going to spend the money and produce nuclear weapons material, if they're going to spend the money and put together the other bits and pieces of a nuclear weapon. That's a capability. That's likely to spread as time passes, just as, as, as technology spreads, as world, the world becomes more developed. But I think it's important not to exaggerate the extent to which the capability in the sense of actually having something close at hand, the capability in the sense that if we walked into the Ford Motor Plant in, in Dearborn, Michigan, we'd know that at the beginning of the plant there was a capability to produce a car at the other end of the plant. That capability, I think, is not likely to spread, and we should make that distinction. It's an important distinction. I, finally, I would say in terms of the technical constraints, it's harder than uh, any of this suggests. Just from watching the problem out there, it's harder to make nuclear weapons than you think, even though the capability is spreading, even though a lot of people know how it's supposed to be done in theory. When you sit down and try to put theory into practice, it's not quite as easy. Right. So the first thing, though, that you want to do is recognizing that the technology is spreading. You want to make it harder for countries to acquire nuclear weapons. This is important because it can buy you time. It can buy you a lot of time sometimes. And buying time is important because things can happen. You know, we buy time with the Libyans and Colonel Gaddafi, and for all I know, Colonel Gaddafi will fall off his camel tomorrow and break his neck. And that'll make the Libyan non-proliferation problem a lot more simple. But you buy time also because you can do things with it. You can try to buy time to strengthen political and security situations. You can reduce the motivations that countries have to acquire nuclear weapons. And the two fit together nicely. And let me give you the Pakistan example, which has come up here. And I think Pakistan is a very good example of 
the interrelationship between the technical side, trying to make it harder for somebody to set out on the bomb business, and the political side of trying to reduce his motivations for doing it. We spend a lot of time in the late 1970s, this administration continues to spend a lot of time, making it harder for countries to acquire nuclear explosives, including Pakistan. But what happens in 1979, if my history is still correct, is the Soviets invade Afghanistan and the world changes suddenly. Suddenly Pakistan becomes important, not because of non-proliferation, but because the Soviets are up there in Afghanistan and because of big ticket strategic interests. And you can put together then an aid program with Pakistan, an aid program which to my mind has given us some real leverage to try to convince Zia that a bomb is not in his future. And without that aid program and without the military hardware that goes with it, the leverage would have been gone. So your technical constraints, buy your time, you can use that time, and fortuitous things happen uh, that you don't expect. Right? In terms of, of the technical side of, of trying to slow the acquisition of nuclear weapons, it's awfully important to continue to work the other nuclear suppliers. And here I would disagree. It seems to me that the nuclear suppliers in the course of the late 70s in the, in the Carter administration, finally started to take nonproliferation seriously. And they've continued to take it seriously. And one of the things that we've done a lot is to have what you could call, for want of a better term, kind of pep rallies every now and then with the nuclear suppliers to convince them that this is an important problem, that you're not supposed to be selling stuff to the wrong people, and so on. The Chinese are an extremely important case here, because I think what the Chinese have done over the course of the last two or three years is finally moved from being part of the problem to part of the solution. The Chinese have finally accepted some of the basic constraints that the other suppliers accept on what you do as a nuclear supplier in the world, and I can go into this further. And let me sort of sum up this piece. Part of what you can do is to, in putting together a defense in depth is to, to strengthen technical constraints to make it harder for somebody to get nuclear weapons. You've got to work with your other suppliers. I think we've been doing that. I think that we've built upon a record of doing that. You've got to work with people like the Chinese who are new suppliers and convince them that there are certain types of behavior which are in their own interest. And I think that has been taking place. On the horizon, though, you've got the Argentinas, the Brazils, other countries that will supply technology. Motivations you can try. The second part of this defense in depth is to reduce the motivations to acquire nuclear weapons. And I've suggested I think the aid relationship with Pakistan holds out the best chance of convincing Zia that his security will not be served in this direction. I think in terms of our alliances, it's, it's quite true that the strongest U.S. nonproliferation policy measure for the better part of 40 years has been a strong alliance system, and I think the alliance system now is strong. It's just weathered an effort by the Soviets in the early 80s to break its back over the deployment of nuclear weapons in Europe, and the alliance in the United States and the alliance in the United States were always in crisis. I mean, you can go back to foreign affairs, and there's an annual issue of foreign affairs where somebody writes an article about the NATO alliance in crisis. It's had 40 crises over 40 years. It's always in crisis, but somehow there's enough common interest so the alliance survives, and it's strong. I think it is a very strong alliance today. Finally, in 1974, the Indians test something that they call a peaceful nuclear explosive. There's no difference between a peaceful nuclear explosive and a bomb. If it goes off in your, in your uh, ditch digging in your backyard, it's still very explosive. The Indians call this thing a peaceful nuclear explosive. I'd like to call it a peaceful bomb. They call it a peaceful nuclear explosive because the world's changed. It's no longer fair game to be in the nuclear weapons business. And here I think this norm is, is, is a critical thing to strengthen, and it's one of the institutions that exists. It's out there with something known as the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Right. Let me finish off with a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, side points uh, as we're going through here. Has the priority changed? Uh, is there too little priority to non-proliferation, uh, enough priority, what you will? I have a sense that the priority that's been given to nonproliferation throughout the last 40 years has been that it's an important security issue of the United States, but it is not the most important issue, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, it's not clear to me, though, that uh, that's the wrong priority. I mean, it's not clear to me that somehow you want to shift the need to take serious steps to reduce nuclear weapons between the U.S. and the Soviets, or the need to prevent uh, major conflict in certain regions. You want to shift that into the middle burner. Uh, and here, I think, 
it gets down to a sense of, of how you work nonproliferation as a problem. How do you prevent the spread of nuclear weapons? And I think when people suggest it needs to be the top priority, it needs more priority, it suggests that there's some sort of magic solution. And my own sense, working this problem outside of the government, in the government, is that it's an area in which more resources isn't going to make a big difference. I mean, I could have another 20 guys working for me. I'm not sure that would make much of a difference, to be perfectly frank. The problems are there, they're hard problems, and they, they don't go away. Better ideas would help. It would be nice to have some better ideas. Uh, but better ideas are difficult to come by in any business, and it's not for want of thinking. I mean, I always try to think. Every morning when I go swimming, I try to think of a better idea to sort of convince India and Pakistan that they want to, you know, sit down in bed with each other like the lamb and the uh, lion. lion. Thanks. Um, so I'm not sure that uh, shifting the priority or more resources is, is a big panacea. I think nonproliferation is an area of many small steps. It's a lot of people who work the problem slowly but steadily, and we do little bits and pieces. And those little bits and pieces add up somehow to more than the sum of the parts. This gets us to you know, how well we're doing. We've already heard the famous Kennedy quote in the Kennedy Center. The, the poor president has been uh, quoted on this about a thousand times in the last three years. It's become very popular, and, and I can, must say that we in the administration contributed to this uh, use of this quote all over the place. Uh, it is true that we haven't done as badly as people feared we would do. I think there's another way, though, to put that, which is that there's a lot of countries who could have acquired nuclear weapons who didn't. And as we sit around and think about acquiring nuclear weapons, we should remember that these are dangerous things. And we should remember that uh, they're a very, very mixed blessing. And that for a lot of leaders out there in the world, when they look at nuclear weapons, they're not very enthusiastic about them. I mean, you go through Europe today in terms of countries that could have acquired nuclear weapons, the Dutch, the Italians, the Germans, and, and, and a whole bunch of others. You go around elsewhere in the world, people who could have and didn't, the Swedes, the Swiss, the Swedes and the Swiss, as, as Roger suggested, once were a little bit pregnant, then they had a weapons program, and then they gave it up. Um, so a lot of people could have and didn't because these things are dangerous. So I actually believe that uh, we can do much better than the pessimists at this table believe, and, and that's because in, in the terms of the famous joke, which in mixed company and in, in, in a proper setting I won't tell, I really do believe there's a pony in there somewhere, and I am very much the optimist. Let me add one final point, though, which goes to Roger's long-term, you know, what are we going to be like in the year 2300? Uh, we shouldn't assume that what we got now is the game we're going to be playing. And here I just throw one thing out. There could come along some sort of tremendous shock, and that might change the system completely. I mean, I can imagine a situation in which 25 years from now there's a small power nuclear exchange, and the world might look completely different after that in terms of what people were prepared to do in terms of preventing the spread of nuclear weapons or otherwise. And so I think as any of you want to think down the road out to Roger's future of 100 years from now, you ought to ask yourselves what kind of shocks could happen which would change the whole parameters of the problem. Uh, and, and there are various shocks. Um, I think one more minute. I was asked by Paul to comment on, uh, on plutonium. I think, well, the highly enriched uranium, we're pushing money back into the budget like we do every year. I just signed a letter today. More money, and it's, we're working the problem. Mm -hmm. On the plutonium, I think here the key question is, which has come out, Everybody agrees that plutonium is dangerous stuff. You can use this to make weapons. You can use it to run power plants. But it's dangerous because you can use it to make weapons. The question is, do we have enough leverage to force our key allies in Europe and Japan not to use it when they believe it is necessary for their energy security? And that's, that's the question. The view of this administration has been that if we try to do that, A, we don't have the leverage. And B, we're likely to weaken the alliances in ways that George Rasmussen said is a bad idea. And so from our perspective, if you don't have the leverage, what you have to do is cut a deal with these people. You've got to tell them, all right, we will go along with your use of plutonium as a civilian fuel, but we want to influence how you use it. We want to make it safer rather than unsafe and so on. And let me, uh, let me conclude uh, there. Okay. He really did talk twice as fast as he normally does. Uh, why don't we, uh, at this stage, throw it open for uh, questions. I noticed there were all these uh, microphones here, which I presume are just uh, 
to make it uh, easier to uh, recognize people. There are a couple up there as, uh, as well. So if you would just uh, line up others, we can do it. Right there. Done. Um, you spoke about uh, nuclear weapons um, carrying a certain prestige, and it's important to nations. Self-image, sometimes they, they think that's important. Do you think there's the potential for the uh, recent space shuttle launches and that sort of thing to diffuse some of that importance that nations place on nuclear weapons? For instance, we send up a Saudi prince and the um, Russians set up a, Ru a Romanian, I think and if that keeps on. I think what's taken place over the course of the last 20 years as this norm of nonproliferation has, has strengthened is that the prestige benefits of acquiring nuclear weapons have been reduced. And I think they've been reduced not simply because, you know, of something like the space shuttle, but what you're, I think, pointing to is there are big countries in the world that have a lot of prestige which don't have nuclear weapons. The Germans and the Japanese are key examples. And so I think as it becomes clear in international life that you can uh, have a lot of influence in the world on key political and economic decisions without nuclear weapons, as the Japanese and the Germans surely do, that that lowers the prestige of having these weapons. And I think that has taken place over the last uh, 20 years. I think that now the main driving force to acquire nuclear weapons is much less prestige and much less a sense that, uh, well, I've got to have them because... Uh, They'll make me a big man on the block or something. Then the security factor. Anybody else like to? I just like to comment briefly and uh, to make a distinction between what I would call overt uh, proliferation and latent proliferation. Uh, it is true that President Kennedy was wrong when he predicted 20 or so nations, uh, 20 or 30 years hence, having declared nuclear weapons. Uh, but what you have in the world are rapidly accumulating stockpiles of materials that can be rapidly turned into weapons. And you have nations acquiring those stockpiles who are also acquiring the capabilities on relatively short notice to make weapons, something that Roger Molander was speaking of before. And the point I was trying to get across before is that latent proliferation can be just as dangerous and perhaps even perhaps more dangerous in the sense that when that shock comes, we may suddenly find ourselves in a world not with 20 nuclear powers, but 30 to 50 nuclear powers. And what I'm trying to get across is the notion of delegitimizing the production and uh, use of atom bomb material that happens to be declared for peaceful purposes. One, because the safeguards that are applied to those by the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, that are applied to those materials are not effective to give the kind of timely warning you would want of a diversion and a sudden push to nuclear weapons by one or more nations. And secondly, the physical security problem, uh, transporting that material, the terrorist threat. Uh, Lou didn't mention the terrorist threat in discussing, well, it's okay to go ahead and let our allies uh, make use of this U.S. origin plutonium because we're avoiding yet another uh, shock, another problem uh, with our closest allies. If we have one a year, as he says, then perhaps we should have one dedicated to proliferation problems and try to hammer that out before we seed the world with uh, hundreds and eventually thousands of tons of plutonium. Next. Uh, yeah, Mr. Dunn um, talked about uh, arguing necess not necess that um, the proliferation issue shouldn't necessarily be first in the priority of you know the national policy agenda or whatever, simply because it's a he said it was a system of, of small steps and, you know, not big <coughs> initiatives or, or radical changes. Um, what, I'd like to just address the, the rest of the panel. What do you think, uh, you know, what position should proliferation p play in, you know, the, the emphasis of government policy? Is it really a front burner issue? And, and if not, what uh, priority should we give? Let me, let me make a first shot at that. Um, I agree with Lou that that you can't argue that proliferation in all instances will be the most important, but the, particularly at the Kennedy School, as people study bureaucratic politics and know how things work in the real world, that there's a threshold of interest and there's a threshold of resources that the United States government over the 40 years sometimes has been above and sometimes has been below. And I think I really, I fundamentally disagree with Lou's point that that we're now above that threshold and that things are basically okay and that with some marginal more money, you're not gonna have much difference because having um, reviewed just the, the fact that 
that there have been hundreds of man years of expertise that are now lost that are not accessible to the U.S. government in basic facts so that, that when those failures are very obvious, I think the, the obvious question is, will more resources help marginally? And I think the answer is yes. The second one is, let me use the example of South Asia. The way the bureaucracy in the State Department is set up is usually the Middle East and India and Pakistan are in the same part of the bureaucracy, which means that the most senior person who really knows that area is about 20th or 30th down from the secretary in terms of hierarchy. The, and that's always been the case. Well, if this is an area where we could easily have a nuclear war, much higher probability in South Asia than in the Middle East, maybe it's useful to have someone much further up in the bureaucracy to watch this full time. And things like that aren't happening. And the, I'm not talking about hundreds of people, but I do think that marginal changes in staff will make a real difference. Right. I'd say it is a front burner issue, but there's no room on the front burners. And I think that's probably the most important facet of the, of, if you will, the superpower arms control problem and the fact that it has lingered on the front burner for 15 years. Um, when I came to this business, the strategy that I was thrown into was, hey, we'll work this U.S.-Soviet arms control problem real quick, and then we'll move past that and get to this proliferation problem, which clearly if you had any perspective on science, was the long-term problem. And we've spent 15, 16 years now with this thing stuck on the front burner, with now the media just fascinated by all the bean counting. Presidents get all wrapped up in it. I can count beans better than the last guy can count beans. And until that, and there's always the Middle East sitting on the other front burner, I would say, until you get U.S.-Soviet nuclear arms control off the front burner, as in, rendered boring, as in do something, but just get it out of our face. You're not going to have, you're not going to be able to bring this thing forward to the front burner because God knows we've long since passed the time where the numbers mean anything. Let me uh, give a slightly complicated answer. I think if we, if we approach the problem in a way that offers promise in the long term of solving a, a problem, it's probably worth paying a lot of, uh, uh, using up a lot of chips to achieve that objective. Uh, if we can solve a real, take, take uh, uh, Tom's uh, South Asian problem, I'd be willing to see the United States spend a lot to, to solve the uh, Indian-Pakistani problem in a fundamental way uh, so that the motivations uh, on the part of each to acquire nuclear weapons would be uh, really diminished. I wouldn't be willing to pay very much at all uh, to get, uh, say, the uh, Japanese or the Chinese or somebody else uh, to cut off the export of a particular kind of a component to Pakistan that might facilitate its getting weapons, because it seems to me that's a very short-term, not very productive way of approaching the problem. So I think you have to look at what the long-term prospects of success are, and if, there's, if there's, it's an important area of the world, I'd say it ought to command very high priority. Brief comment. I, I would answer, of course, I think it should be a higher priority than it presently is, but I think a lot can be done without it being the highest priority. Uh, for example, uh, to not confront, but to deal with our allies on their uh, on the question of whether this plutonium is needed for their, for their long-term energy security. It, it turns out that the original premise for the use of plutonium as a fuel no longer applies. The premise was a, a scarcity of natural uranium and therefore the need for an, a substitute uh, fuel. It now turns out that uh, uranium is a, a very plentiful resource. Uh, and in countries that uh, would be uh, reliable suppliers to fellow allies. Uh, in fact, there's 20 million tons of it in the world, uh, enough for some 4,000 nuclear power plants, uh, lifetime supply compared with the 300 or so now operating. We aren't dealing on these issues. We're avoiding making it a front burner issue uh, by trying to downplay uh, the obvious things that could be worked on to uh, make it less of a problem. It doesn't have to be a world crisis problem, but it ought to be one that we're applying maybe 20 more folks to, Lou, to uh, try to make the technical case and also to work on developing alternative arrangements such as multinational storage facilities for spent fuel rather than 
national uh, reprocessing of spent fuel, working out uh, the waste problems. You can do that without it being a front burner issue. Can I comment again? Yes, you, you can. Thanks. But if all five of you answer every question, we'll never get, no, we'll no. Never get from in there. But That's we key. shouldn't make it four out of five. So That's the front burner question. Yeah. Well, I think the key question is when you say what priority should it have is to define what you mean in terms of, of priority. I can think of two or three issues of nonproliferation which have uh, crunched up against other strategic interests and political interests of the United States which have gone to the president and the president has made a decision which everybody here who is in favor of nonproliferation would be happy with. So in that sense, it has a high priority. But what I am saying is that it's a field in which what is needed is less bodies than brains. It's a field in which if you, if any of you sit out there, and Roger probably, since he says he's been reading up into the subject, I bet you can read through the same books and it will give you the same ideas and the same <coughs> solutions and you will not find new and innovative thinking. And I think what it needs is, is, is ideas. As to the question of of Pakistan, which is Tom's example, I've got one person who spends full time on India and Pakistan, and there's somebody who's probably oh, three levels down from the Secretary of State who spends more of his time on Pakistan than he cared to spend on Pakistan. And so I don't think uh, we should assume that it's being neglected. I think there's a difference between saying that it's a problem which has to be solved by the slow boring of thick boards and saying that uh, it has a low priority. But I but I just come back to the point that uh, it's maybe it's from being in the government too long. Uh, I think it needs I, it needs good ideas. That's what's necessary, and that that that's what uh, I mean. I'd love to know what George, if George would give me his example. If we spent a lot on India and Pakistan, which would get them to do something, give me what that means in detail. That I'd love to buy. I'll take it back and run it around Washington. We've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Leventhal and anyone else who cares to comment. The September issue of Scientific American carried an article on the current procedures for checking the flow of uranium from mining through refining to implementation in either weapons or power plants. And I was wondering what you know about the possibility of beefing up the checking at low levels, the level of mining and initial refining to prevent the spread of, of this material? The weakest link in an already weak system of international safeguards is at the very front end of the fuel cycle, the mining and milling of uh, uh, uranium. And the rationale for that uh, up to now has been that, well, this isn't weapons material and it really doesn't get sensitive until it reaches the fabrication or the, or the enrichment plant. Uh, all that may change very rapidly uh, in terms of the sensitivity of the material, not necessarily the safeguards. Uh, here we need, again, some leverage applied by the U.S. and hopefully the Soviet Union uh, to, uh, to try to bring that about. Uh, but the reason natural uranium becomes more sensitive at the front end is that advanced enrichment technologies utilizing uh, centrifuges and soon lasers will make it relatively cheap and easy to, uh, uh, to uh, enrich uranium to a high grade. And when I say cheap and easy, it's a, it's, a, it's a sensitive technology, but every technology that's been developed in the nuclear field has ultimately become a commercial item. And if this technology gets out, then every uh, pound of uh, uranium uh, from the time it comes out of the earth should be very carefully accounted for, and the safeguard system does not yet accomplish that. We'll have to, we're running out of time, so if we can make questions brief, and we'll try to make responses uh, brief as well. Yeah. Okay, I guess I'll address this to Lewis Dunn. Um, you, you, since you were the one looking for answers, um, to what extent do you think the technology of um, the Strategic Defense Initiative could contribute to a solution to the dangers of nuclear pro proliferation? I think we get here. We get here into the. <coughs> the key question of to what extent is there a significant relationship between what takes place in the U.S.-Soviet strategic relationship and what takes place in terms of the spread of nuclear weapons. I think that the decision to acquire nuclear weapons in the types of countries we're thinking about, most of them 
third world developing countries is a decision which is going to be made very much on regional security calculations. And what takes place in the U.S.-Soviet strategic relationship, in my view, has very little influence on that. I think the strategic defense initiative and the basic U.S.-Soviet strategic relationship has to be analyzed then and evaluated on its own merits, not in terms of what impact it has on, on the Ruritanians uh, 20 years down the road. I'm sure we can get members of the panel who disagree with that. Let me just assure you that you could. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you see as the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency in, uh, in this question of proliferation? Can it be effective? Should it be effective? How much money is in the budget for it this year? I think the, Interna the International Atomic Energy Agency <coughs> has an important role to play in trying to detect the misuse of nuclear material from peaceful purposes to military purposes. Over the past uh, decade, considerable effort has been made, and we've made considerable effort to strengthen its effectiveness, to make it better managed, and to improve its capability to deal with safeguards, in other words, this system to detect misuse. I think there's a lot that still can be done with the agency. At this point in time, I would say that it is improving, that it is basically effective. Paul will tell you that it's not effective, and we could debate it for the rest of the night. Paul, do you want to say it's not effective? Yes, very briefly. Beyond that, I would say why it's not effective. It is an international organization with all the problems appertaining there, too. It's an organization that has to have uh, substantial technical and political resources to do its job right. It doesn't have those for reasons that, again, could be discussed at great length. Let me just say simply that a job that it could manage effectively would be the accounting for non-weapons usable material, which involves a long time to turn into weapons material. So it could account for low enriched uranium in the form of fresh fuel and unreprocessed spent fuel reasonably well. And it could also manage an, inter an international spent fuel storage bank uh, uh, and other multinational international uh, facilities not involving weapons material, if at all possible. There is no initiative from the United States that I'm aware of right now to try to direct the agency's efforts uh, where it can do the most effective job. Instead, we get this kind of, um, I'll be polite, uh, this kind of very optimistic language about the agency is, is okay, it's doing the best job it can, and we can basically depend upon it. I think that's highly misleading. Okay, two more questions we have. And, uh, yes. um, this is mainly to Lewis Dunn. Uh, do you think American military, conventional military aid to Pakistan is helping to make Zia secure if, as would seem reasonable from Pakistan's point of view, Zia's insecurity seems, stems mainly from India's peaceful nuclear capacity? I think that the basic strength and security relationship with the United States and the prospect of continuing that relationship over time <coughs> is what holds out the best chance for uh, Pakistani security vis-a-vis Whatever problem. That was short. Uh, I, have, I have a very, uh, just a quick observation and then a very short two part question to Tom Graham. The observation is that uh, you really shouldn't be worried about the low budget that this administration uh, allocates towards nuclear proliferation because it really doesn't cost very much to poison camels. Uh, the second, the, the two part question is uh, who provides the money, do you feel? Um, for General Zia's efforts in trying to acquire a nuclear capability. And uh, given that General Zia does not uh, ride on camels, what do you think um, could be done to, uh, or what do you think would stop him from pushing for a nuclear capability? On the issue of uh, funding of the nuclear weapons program, um, for, any, for any sort of any state the size of Pakistan, the amount of money that it takes to fund one of these programs is really quite small. So whether he did or didn't get some resources from any number of governments is really not a very important question. And given that money's fungible, you know, we've given Pakistan aid too. So I, I think that issue and is there an Islamic bomb because money has transferred one way or another is probably more uh, an issue of um, was uh, Bhutto a good salesman and was he able to try to 
get aid into Pakistan saying whatever he would say regardless of what he might do later on. So I don't think that's a very important question. Um, in terms of what would really encourage Zia not to produce nuclear weapons, I agree with Lou Dunn that, that a strong U.S. relationship with Pakistan is, <coughs> is by definition something that's needed. But, and, but at the same time as you do that, as you do that diligently, working very hard, that the signals that have been sent out because the U.S. hasn't in a very visible fashion paid a price on both sides to really risk something to solve some of the basic problems, you haven't solved the, the insecurity from the India perspective. I'm not sure it's possible, but I think that, that it's, a, it's the hard trade-off. And I think that, that what didn't happen earlier on was the United States didn't try to drive a hard bargain very early on in that relationship and say, the Carter administration can be faulted for not giving them as much support as they should have, but also at the same time making a very clear fire break so that they wouldn't be just five minutes away from a bomb. And because that step was taken in an administration that I participated in, um, it means that it was all the more difficult for Ludan to try to manage that problem when he inherited it, which was you know, much worse than, than it was earlier down the line. Um, I think in one instance there is a, there is a success in South Asia that, that shouldn't be overlooked, and that is after India detonated its bomb in 74, India didn't produce nuclear weapons, it didn't transfer them to other countries, that um, the same thing so far has been true of Pakistan, and that as both those countries have become used to the fact that there is a capability there, the rhetoric and the pressure for nuclear weapons on either side, though it sort of ebbs and flows, um, both countries have become more mature about what this actually means. And fundamentally, those two countries are going to have to work out their own modus operandi, and American influence is really relatively marginal. So slowing it down is important. But I think that, that the problem is usually there's a relationship. If you wait too long, you have to increasingly pay a higher and higher price to get into the poker game, and that the U.S. historically, this isn't one administration versus another, has waited too long to put in a serious bid on the poker table, and by then the probability of success is very, very small. And it's just, it's a catch-22, as Roger said, if it's not on the front burner, you can't get people to say, let's do something that's really a big deal. <laughs> well, this is, uh, this problem of uh, nuclear proliferation, what it means is an enormously complicated one to deal with even in the, the time we had. I guess it's, uh, as it's always been, that somehow we have to manage to walk the fine line between uh, complacency on the one hand, um, that, uh, well, she's not nearly as bad as we thought it would be, so I guess everything's all right, and uh, fatalism on the other, that, well, gee, uh, this is a technology, the, the horse is out of the barn, or six horses are out of the barn, or seven horses are out of the barn and others saying, but wait a minute, there's still another 150 horses in the barn. It's worth uh, trying to keep the door closed. So uh, it's one we're going to have to keep working on, not only the people at this table, but uh, some of you as uh, well. I want to thank the student council of the Center for International Affairs and all of you and especially our speakers for being with us tonight. Thank you all very much.